The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hi, everyone, and welcome to our webinar, Best Practices for Reporting Class Data, um, with the subtitle, What Happens After Class Observations Are Done. Um, and this is with Sarah Haddon and Vicki Kittner-Duffy. Um, today, the webinar will be about an hour. It'll be about 45 minutes of content, and then we'll leave like 10 to 15 minutes at the end for any questions that you have. And if we don't get to your question today, don't worry, I'll be collecting them and I'll send them to Sarah and Vicki afterwards and they can respond via email to you. Or if your question is comp too complicated to answer over a webinar, what we can do it that way as well. Um, so don't worry, we'll get, it will get answered no matter what. Um, so yeah, and as a reminder, this is being recorded, so it will be sent to you tomorrow um, with the slides as well. And if you know anyone that missed the webinar or wants to watch it afterwards, you can send them that recording um, tomorrow when we email it to you. So I'm gonna send it over to Sarah and Vicki for a minute and they can introduce themselves and let you know who they are. Hi, I'm Sarah Haddon. Um, and if you've been on our previous two data uh, webinars, you know who I am, but I'm our senior advisor for research and professional services here at Teachstone. And I've been working with class for the last 15 years um, and uh, definitely have experience with some um, large scale data collections. So, Vicki, I'll mute and you can introduce yourself. Okay. Hi, everyone. I am Vicki Kintner Duffy. I'm a research and evaluation specialist here, um, and I've been partnering with Sarah on the previous uh, webinars in this series. Um, and I've been using the class for about 10 years in a variety of research studies, um, as well as um, program assessments and things. And so we're um, happy to kind of close out the series today and help everybody with your data collection needs. All right, and I forgot to add that if you have any audio visual problems during the webinar, just send me a question on, I'll try to help you um, in fixing them. So we're gonna start with two polls first. The first one I'm gonna start now, which is what is your role? And you can choose from coach, mentor, data person, administrator, or teacher. And we'll leave that up for maybe like 30 seconds and then we'll see who, um, who's here today. So it's like right now that's about 50% coach mentor and about 33% administrator and then the rest teacher and data. And that's a, most of the audience has voted. So let me show you those results. Yep, so about 45% coach mentor, 14% data person, 35% administrator, and then about 6% are teachers today. Well, welcome everybody. We're really glad you're here. And then we can go to the next slide with the other poll that we have. So the other one is at what level do you report data? So we have teacher classroom level, school site level, program agency level, and district entity level. Let's see, a large portion right now are either program agency or teacher classroom level. We'll them for a few more seconds. All right, so I'm gonna close this. And then share. So yeah, we have about 30% teacher classroom level, 8% school site level, 55% program agency level, and then 8% district entity level. Okay, and that's great to know. Thank you, Caitlin, for uh, the polls. And I'm going to start us off on the first part of the webinar, and then um, when we get into the, this is Sarah, by the way, and then when we get into the uh, the data visualization or the data displays, and Vicki's going to take over. So. Um, we have three objectives for you, and it really focuses on those considerations um, that you need to take in mind when you're um, developing your reporting system. And the three parts are creating the data, visualizing the data, and using the data to improve, uh, to drive improvement. Um, did want to let you know that this webinar is predicated on the assumption that you've already collected and analyzed your data and you're getting ready to write reports. However, if you're not there, that's okay. Uh, the information should still be um, relevant to you. Um, the first thing to think about when you're creating re your report is who is your audience, um, as that's going to determine what you'll include in your report. Um, we also think about reading the report, which is really part of that visualization. So how you visually display data um, 
that allows the reader to take meaning from that data. Um, I'm sure all of us have seen research studies where we look at the data and go, huh, that's interesting. I wonder what it says. So how you visualize the data is really important. And then the final section on using data to make is on using data to make decisions. Um, and that will focus on how to use the information in the reports to make decisions ranging from individual teacher PD to school program and even district wide initiatives. And we'll go into all of this in much more detail. Uh, and uh, those of you who've been on before, this will look familiar. Um, but when we think about a class implementation, we break it down into these four two steps. Um, we discussed step one and step two in the previous webinars. Um, and if you weren't a part of those, um, you can readily find them on the Teach Stone website um, under webinars. And then where we are today is thinking about um, sharing the results, and um, we'll touch upon putting that data into action. All right, so when we think about um, creating the report, we have to think first, as I said, about that primary audience. Um, because as I said, you're going to tailor your report to that audience. If you're writing a report for a teacher, which we have first on our list, you would provide a pretty different information than you would if you were writing the report for a funder. Um, a teacher is likely to want to know how her classroom scored um, during the observation, and our best practice suggests that you would also include brief descriptions of interactions that the observer noted in that observation. Um, we are going to go into the Coach's role in a little bit more on another slide, um, but let's go to the other end where we're thinking about um, stakeholders. So we're talking about accrediting agencies, funders, governmental bodies. Um, they're not going to be that interested in specific examples of teacher-child interactions um, in classroom X, Y, or Z. Um, they really want those big picture questions. What are the domain level scores for this organization? What were the ranges per dimension? And how does this organization scores compare with established benchmarks? And later, we're going to give you a sample table of contents um, for both teacher level and administrator um, and um, stakeholder reports. And when we talk about stakeholders, we really are thinking about key funders or governmental bodies. Um, so here we look at the purpose of the report. Um, and the purpose of the report links to um, the purpose of the data collection. So you have to step back and say, why did we collect this data in the first place? Um, nobody collects data uh, just as an exercise um, and fun. Um, they do it because they have some specific goals that they want to reach. Um, generally, we see that data are collected for PD, evaluation, and high stakes. So when we think about teachers, again, in professional development, helping teachers identify their strengths and their areas of growth. For coaches, it's also professional development um, because they're the ones who are likely to be overseeing that professional development for the teacher. And it helps them identify areas of, of strength for teachers and also those areas of growth to help them uh, have teachers be much more intentional in how they interact with kids. Um, administrators are often looking at evaluation, and we're talking about those trends across the program um, so that they can then think about how to best target their professional development. Um, I, you know, in the ideal world, every, every program would have a coach who could spend time with each teacher, but we know that the world is not ideal, so sometimes that professional development comes in, in PLCs or other kinds of group activities. So when teachers can I'm sorry, when, it, when coaches can look and see what's going on across or administrators can look and see what's going on across, it really helps them target that PD. And then again, um, that stakeholders, um, it's really to determine decisions about staffing and funding. Um, and how you, how you report these, your different audience is going to, again, depend on your purpose. So if it's an evaluation of a program, then you'll do a program level report. If you want to see how specific schools or sites are doing, you may want to do school level reports. We noticed in the poll that uh, most of you were doing either teacher level or, um, or program level. Um, and um, then a, I've already said the next point, so I think I will just go ahead. Um, to our next slide. So information um, to include, um, 
And those of you who've been through this now third webinar will know that Vicki and I often say it depends because it really does depend. Um, so the information to include depends on the audience. Administrators typically see more information than teachers. A report for teachers generally focuses just on that teacher's classroom. Um, and the decision, there's always a decision to make about whether or not to share scores um, with teachers, and it's really an individual decision that's made um, by an organization. Teachers who've been observed in the past and have a really solid understanding of both class and how class is scored, that is the one to seven range, um, are in a much better position to see their scores than our teachers who have less knowledge. Um, I would also say that um, because class is most meaningful when it's paired with professional development, it's important that we include information about those areas of strength and those areas of growth. Um, it's not only important at the teacher level, but again, it helps coaches identify uh, targets for when they're working with teachers. And as I mentioned before, it can help them develop um, groups of PLCs based on teachers' profiles. Um, and it can also, I've already said this too, uh, sorry, I tend to front load. Um, when we think about comparison data, um, it could be pre-post data in the same year. So you want to see um, what growth looks like over time. It can help an organization uh, learn how well their professional development has been working. If um, an organization is part of a QRIS, they can see how they fall um, in terms of those tiers of their QRIS system um, and help them develop those goals for improvement. It can also be instructive to compare um, how your organization looks in comparison to certain benchmarks, and there are research benchmarks that tell us that this is a level um, below which children are unlikely to make um, really solid gains in those classrooms. Um, and so looking to see where your classroom falls in terms of those benchmarks is important. Um, and then um, the other thing is comparing to previous observations. Um, sometimes I talk with people who um, always want to know what are the national norms so I can compare my organization to the national norms. And comparing to other organizations, comparing that way can be instructive, but it's also really instructive to think about where was, where was my program last year or where was this teacher last year and where is this teacher now so that we're comparing them to themselves and able to, to see um, what, growth has, um, what growth they've made. Oops. Um. Okay, so this is our table of contents. Um, it does outline the types of information that is typically included in the report, and it does identify the appropriate audience. You can see that we recommend that all audiences um, should receive background information about class. Um, um, not everybody works with class all the time, um, and so sometimes a little refresher doesn't hurt. Um, and someone who knows a lot about, a about the class can skim over that section, um, but then it's still there to benefit everybody else. Uh, administrators and stakeholders really need to understand um, how data were collected. Um, so this includes not only the timeline for the data collection, um, but the number of classrooms that were observed. If uh, it's a larger program and they can't observe all of the classrooms, then uh, the report should include information on how classrooms were sampled, um, we hope randomly. Um, the report uh, should also talk about the number of cycles and what kind of training observers had. Um, teachers and coaches don't necessarily need all this information. I mean, the coaches, the coaches should know, um, and the teachers, they were there, um, so they probably don't necessarily need to have all that to read through. Um, but even when people have that good understanding of domains and dimensions, as I said before, it's good to restate what class measures. Um, staff turnover is an issue. Um, and there are some organizations that also make portions of their class reports available to the public. Um, and so if the public sees them, they may not have that context. And so it's helpful for that. Um, and then we'll see that there are data tables there. Um, and at this point, um, we're not going to talk about that visualization, um, but most people really should get a look at some of those tables. Um, and the larger the organization, the more likely it is that you will have many data tables. Um, and the examples, I didn't really talk about that, but those examples, again, are those strengths and weaknesses um, 
or strengths and areas growth of growth that we see in the in the classroom. Any questions, Caitlin? Okay, thank you. Um, so program level reporting. There are different things um, that we can look at, and I've mentioned some of this already. But let's think about it in terms of um, of the bigger picture and not the specific audience. Um, so that program level report can include those program wide averages to compare to benchmarks, the distribution um, of scores across classrooms. And Vicki's going to show you an example of that. And those are really helpful because um, it can help you see in not just you know, a domain level average or dimension level averages for your program, but it can also, also help you see how different, um, how different classrooms are doing or how different sites within your program um, are, are doing in terms of the quality of their interactions. Um, and that also comes to then those comparisons within the program. Comparisons within the programs can be really helpful, especially if you have some teachers who are really doing well and perhaps they can um, take on a little bit of a mentoring role um, if, it's, if it's done with grace and ease. Um, or grace and tact, I think I'm going to say. Um, so an administrator of a large district may want to know how different schools stack up against each other. And so you can report data that way. Um, some larger programs, especially if they're in urban areas, um, have very different sectors. So they'll ha they may have early childhood special education. They may have Montessori. Um, they may have um, some different specialized charter programs, um, such as such as KIPP, for example. Um, and you can present data in that way um, to see how the sectors are doing. Um, and then if you're in Head Start, you can look to see how your data compares to the national data that are collected in the most in the most recent uh, monitoring year. All right, so I'm going to try to start this section on approaches to sharing information with teachers on a little bit of a lighthearted note. Um, I like to think in, in positive terms, but I'm going to uh, start off by telling you what not to do. Um, so don't do this. Um, don't leave a report in a teacher's mailbox that shares the scores and doesn't explain anything. Um, about 10 years ago, I was uh, working on a social emotional learning um, research project and I went out to a school uh, to meet with one of our teachers. And when I walked into the room after school, she was obsessively poring over this cl her class report. And she looked up at me and said, basically, hey, you know this stuff. Can you tell me what it means? Um, and it was really a problem for her because she had no context for class. And she just knew that they'd done the observations, that they were very important, and she had no way of knowing what these scores meant or how it, how it fit within a broader perspective. Um, so I don't think that it's very common that that happens anymore. Um, I hope not um, anyway. Um, but I can tell you that I had to do some, um, some damage control for that teacher. The, the teacher actually had done fairly well, but because she didn't know the one to seven scoring, point scoring scale, she was a little bit upset about some of her scores. Um, so, so please don't do it that way. Um, everybody will be much happier in the long run. <laughs> um, OK, so as we mentioned, scores versus ranges. Um, so there are, um, there are these different approaches, which we've already mentioned before. And what you also really need to think about is what's meaningful for the teachers. Um, a pro to sharing scores is they help teachers see exactly where they are, and it helps teachers see their growth. And um, and I can think, for example, if a program only sh scored only shared ranges, and a teacher in um, say 20, 2017, 2018, the range for uh, language modeling was a three, and then Oh, I'm sorry, that's not a range, that's a score. The range for language modeling was in the mid-range, but she didn't know where it was in the mid-range, she just knew it was mid-range. And so she worked really hard over the next year to improve her interactions in that area. And then for 2018, 2019, she gets her class report again and her language modeling scores are still in the mid-range. 
So she may feel um, really frustrated because she'd worked so hard, but it could be that that score was a four or even a five because of her, you know, really concerted efforts. And so in a case like that, it might be useful to share scores. Um, uh, so that's a pro to scores. A, a con to scores is that it can, um, it can really negatively impact a teacher's um, feeling of self-efficacy um, because they, yeah, I really, that's it. I only did that. Oh my, I really am not a very good teacher. Um, and then the cons are some unwanted competition between teachers. Well, I did better than you did. Um, and that's not really what you want to have in your program. Um, a pro to ranges is that it can support teacher buy-in um, because it doesn't feel as intimidating or threatening. Um, and it can provide information without focusing on those numbers. Um, Again, um, if teachers don't understand what it means, um, it can be problematic. Um, and, you know, I can think of uh, you going in, you as a coach going in or an administrator going in and say, wow, your classroom, you scored a six on language modeling. And the teacher said, six? What do you mean I'm doing a lot? What do you mean I did great? That's not, six isn't great. I want to be a 10 or a nine. Um, so it can be um it can be problematic in that way. Um, it can also be problematic if teachers look at scores as um, as a test of what they're not doing. Um, uh, on the flip side, with those ranges, the cons to just show, showing ranges that I mentioned before, it's harder to see growth, um, especially at that teacher level. And um, some teachers really aren't satisfied with knowing their ranges. They really want to know how they're doing. Um, and uh, I was trying to think of a great example from real life, but it's escaping me at this point. Um, so I apologize for that. Uh, so report language. Uh, this won't look, uh, I don't think, too surprising to you. Uh, we really want our reports um, for those examples that we're um, giving for teachers and coaches to be objective and specific, describing what happened in the observations, um, and never ever include the observer's opinion. Um, and so I've got an example of an effective and a more effective example. So the ineffective example is that the teacher and children seemed happy during centers. Hmm. Okay. Um, more effective, the teacher and children smiled and laughed as they played together during center time. The lunch helpers were also enthusiastic as they set the table for lunch. The teacher noted, you always have such great time getting ready for lunch. So what I want you to notice is how the first example contains very, late, very vague language. They seemed happy. If someone gave me a report with that language, I would be tempted to get out my red pen and write down, how do you know? What did the teacher say and do? What did the children say and do? Explain to me how they seemed happy. Um, so if we really want to teachers to improve their practice, we want to take the language out of that um, realm of vague vagueness and, and subjective as well. Um, so I've got some examples for each of the domains. Um, so with, for emotional support, we've got a positive climate. Um, the strength is that the teacher greeted um, every child as they came into the room with eye contact and a warm smile. And the area for growth is that the teacher and child affect and enthusiasm were not always matched. The some children giggled and smiled with one another or in response to teachers. Both teachers' tones were occasionally flatter and mismatched for the children. Um, this format works because we can read exactly what the teacher did. They greeted every child. They made eye contact. They smiled warmly. It's like, bingo, okay. I, as a teacher, know what I did um, and know that that's a good thing to do because you've pointed it out. Um, and when we point these things out, it does, like I said, it's, it shows that we're important. Um, it also helps teachers see some of those things that they are doing automatically without even thinking about it to help them remember that this is, this is really what good teaching looks like. It's very powerful for teachers who are new to class, and it's very powerful for teachers who are feeling a little bit skeptical about it. Um, the other thing that's important is when we provide this level of detail, it takes the observer and also the coach, if the coach was not the one doing the report, which ideally they're not, if at all possible, because it, it helps them really see what was happening in the class, um, in, in the classroom during the class observation. 
All right. I think I clicked too hard. Yes, I did. Okay. Um, so we get to behavior management. The teacher made clear expectations. My brain and my reading are not in sync here. I'm sorry. Teacher made expectations clear ahead of time. Remember, let's use our quiet mouse feet as we tiptoe to the centers in an area for growth. The teacher was occasionally reactive to student behaviors. For example, when one child kept turning around during circle time, the teacher told her to turn around many times and the behavior didn't change. What I want you to notice about these examples is that they are very specifically using the language of the class. It is intentional because it helps build that understanding. Um, and in that area of for growth, the teach, observer didn't simply state that the teacher was occasionally reactive, but explained what reactive meant. Um, and as I'm uh, getting ready to move on to the next slide, I also wanted to say that we've given one area of strength, but we've also worked with organizations that give two areas of strength um, because they help two strengths for every area of growth. So it's something to consider. Um, all right, and here we have one for uh, concept development, teacher sample report language. And the strength is that the teacher asked many open-ended questions. Uh, for example, asking children why they think camouflaging is useful for lizards. And that area for growth is that learning was not made personally meaningful for children and there were no opportunities for them to connect new information to their own lives or to existing knowledge. Um, so again, you've got some nice language of the class, um, and that's what we really want to see. Um, and now, um, with that, I'm going to turn this over to I'm going to mute and turn this over to Vicky, who can unmute and talk about visualizing data. Yes, hi everyone. Um, so I, I get the fun part of the graphs. Um, but I do want to, if you can go to the next slide, Sarah. Um, as Sarah mentioned earlier, really, um, you know, the words are very important. Vicky, and those if you're talking, we can't hear you, or maybe just me. Can you? I'm, I am okay. talking. Can anybody I'll hear mute. me? Caitlin, can, or if someone can message Caitlin that you can hear. Okay. I'm trusting that everybody can hear, so let me know if you can't. Um, so really we have um, one include data, vis data visualization um, because sometimes we can get lost in those numbers um, and the, the visualizations really help to create a picture of um, and, and translate all of the data and then all of those numbers into actionable steps. Um, and that can really make the difference between using it or just saying, okay, my report's here, and then that's it. Um, so there are a couple of different ways that we'll kind of talk through, um, yeah, just a second, sorry, a couple of ways that we'll talk through visualization, and there are lots of different tools that can help you do this if you are doing it on your own. Um, you know, there's simple things like some Excel or PowerPoint um, that can let you do graphs and things, um, and then there are more complicated kinds of um, softwares out there. So you kind of have to find what works for you. But um, when we just think of um, really basic visualizations, bar graphs are really helpful, especially for comparisons or when you're trying to see where classrooms are in relation to a target or a benchmark. Um, line charts are really helpful to see the difference over time. And we'll, I'll show you one of those. Um, and then tables are actually really nice. And those are a little bit easier to create sometimes, but it still helps you see um, lots of different numbers all at once and be able to compare those. Okay. So what I'm going to do now is actually just take you through a couple of examples. Um, so here we see a classroom report level. So this is really going to um, to, me, to be meant to be shared to, with the teacher, uh, but it might be a report that goes originally to the administrator or the coach, and then you share that with the teacher. Here we're looking at um, really the dimension ranges. So again, as we were talking scores or ranges earlier, so this is you've made that decision that you want to do ranges, and here's a nice visualization for teachers to see, okay, well within classroom organization, 
where am I for each dimension? Okay, I'm actually scoring high on behavior management and productivity, and then sort of in that mid range for instructional learning formats. And so that gives you information on, you know, where you might want to focus, um, both focusing kind of um, helping the teacher understand those strengths and maybe what strengths in productivity could you bring into instructional learning formats. Um, so that might inform where you're going. So this is just one visualization. It's not even, um, you know, it's not a, I think this one's nice to see because it's not a traditional um, bar graph or line chart or anything like that, but it still gives a nice visual of where a teacher is. Okay, so the next slide. So this is another um, part of that classroom report, but this is where you might wanna show the domain scores. So we have a very traditional bar graph here that shows each domain, emotional support, classroom organization, and instructional support. And what's nice here is where you may put um, a little bit of information about the average. Um, so what this is one classroom in comparison to the number of classrooms at the center or within the program or the district. Um, and so you can see the average line to help see how the teacher compares to the average, as well as then you might set a benchmark or a goal. And so here we see that the benchmarks are, are the goals are, um, and seem, I think about 5.75 for emotional support and classroom organization. Um, and then it looks like about 3.5 for instructional support. And so you see then that for this particular teacher, you're able to very quickly say, okay, emotional support and classroom organization, this teacher is above the goal and above the average. And in instructional support, they're actually above the average, but not quite at that goal. So now again, I can make a decision about where do I go with supporting this particular teacher? And you can kind of quickly do that with this one chart, okay? So then what um, is important too is, um, to then be able to go down to that next level, the dimension score. So actually it's, it's helpful to kind of see a couple of the dimensions in a couple of different ways. Um, and so this dimension in particular, or I'm sorry, this table of dimensions in particular, again, helps you see where um, the teacher is in the relation to the average or the goal. Um, and when we look at, um, instructional support specifically, so this is that same teacher who, is getting an average across the instructional support dimensions of 2.42, um, but you can see that really there's a there's a great strength here in language modeling, and then the teacher's struggling a little bit more in concept development and quality of feedback. And so this kind of display allows administrators and coaches to target PD in a more informed way. Um, and so for me as a coach, I would know, okay, the teacher has those nice things going on in, in language modeling. I'm gonna look at the score sheet. I might look at some of um, maybe the open-ended questions that teacher is asking, and then start to think of, um, well, where can we add more um, into concept development or quality of feedback with some of those things that, that teacher's already doing in language modeling, okay? Next slide. Um, so then program report, a lot of times we're presenting the same kinds of information. Again, everybody wants to know domain, domain, uh, or sorry, domain and dimension um, scores or ranges that those are important to include every time. Um, but then here you're gonna see it's for overall the whole program, however many classrooms were observed for that particular program. Um, so here's a nice example. Again, it's not actually a graph, it's, uh, it's a graphic of um, here's where the overall averages are for each domain and then for each dimension. So again, you can see, oh, well, language modeling is a little bit higher. Um, positive climate is higher. Productivity is higher. And then figure out which ones are lower and where you might want to go with professional development. Um, well, if we go to the next one. Um, this, I think, is even, it's a lot of numbers. Um, but I think it's really helpful. So we take that bigger picture of where is everybody all together, and then this kind of breaks it breaks it down so you can start to make comparisons across the classrooms. Um, and I want to say, you know, we're not making these comparisons in order to say, well, this teacher's great and that teacher's not, um, but to really specifically identify where those strengths are and where those areas of growth are, and how can we support um, the program as a whole. Um, so then, you know, again, you can say, okay, everybody's emotional support and classroom organization are doing 
pretty well, you know, and where are we in relation to our goal? And then that helps me as an administrator understand, okay, it's really emotional support. And even specifically in emotional support, it's concept development or it's quality of feedback that I really want to focus my attention. Um, it could I also you, be- I think you meant yeah. concept, I think you meant instructional support, not emotional support. I, yes, I'm sorry. I meant instructional support. Thank you. <laughs> um, sometimes those domain names get you. Um, so with instru instructional support, I might look specifically and say, okay, almost everybody is below the goal for concept development. So that's where I really want us to focus as a group. Um, it, this also helps you see where teachers might be um, able to support one another. So one example of this is if you look at Jane Smith, this first row here, this first teacher, that, in, that teacher's instructional support score is the 3.42. Um, and so that's a little bit higher than some of the other ones, uh, other teachers um, in that program. And then though, the, her emotional support is 5.13. Um, and so that's a little bit lower than the other ones in the program. And so then if you go all the way down to Laura Davis, um, and please know that these are all fake names. This is not intended to um, point anybody out with those names. Um, that that teacher's emotional support is is higher um, and then the instructional support is lower than in comparison to Jane Smith and so it might be you know a really smart idea to pair them up and to start to help them be able to support each other to watch each other um, to kind of share some of the strategies that they're using in their classrooms um, so that you're bringing both of those teachers um, to a a place with more effective interactions and really building their self-efficacy um, in, in the process. Okay. Um, so we've been sort of, uh, it's not a really, um, in talking about the visualizing, I'm already getting into some of the, what can the visualizations be used for and what can this data be used for? So we're just kind of gonna continue that conversation. Um, but I wanted to talk a little bit about the bigger picture first, and then we'll go to a couple more um, graphs and charts to see how you might do that. Okay, next slide. Um, so some data informed decisions. So some of the things that when you're, um, you know, we think of, okay, here are these nice graphs that we're putting in and they're helping with um, a few specific conversations, but it's helpful, I think, to just think of well, what am I looking for in trying to make decisions? And so um, I think the three main things that you would most likely be looking for are trends. Um, so a trend is, you know, how many people are doing this particular thing or scoring in this particular way. And so here you're going to use the averages across the classrooms um, to see where most of the classrooms are. And that's going to um, help inform those program-wide PD plans. So you're probably gonna use trends a little bit less if you're really at that teacher level. Um, and that, that's gonna focus really um, more at, okay, for my program or for my school, I'm noticing this about a, a few dimensions where they're a little bit lower or they're, um, you know, or where I've seen um, that everybody is reaching the benchmark. And so we don't really wanna focus there, we wanna focus somewhere else. Um, it doesn't mean you are ignoring individual teachers. I think one of the things here, it's almost um, like response to inter intervention where this helps you give that idea of what's, what are the blanket supports for the teachers um, um, or the baseline supports for teachers that you might be providing across your program. And then you can start to get into more individualized support for teachers who might need um, uh, something more specific or, um, or something more intensive. Um, so another thing that you want to look for is growth. Um, so Sarah talked a little bit about that. So that you really want to identify teacher, individual teacher growth, and that's both to highlight success and then start to outline next steps. Again, um, you know we're not going to get to talk about self-efficacy a lot here, um, but you know the data helps you at start to see that, of start to see where teachers are strong, um, and help to then start to point that out to teachers, really building their self-efficacy and helping them see that they can improve um, and see wh why that's important. You know, I think sometimes we get so focused on we have to get the data, the data has 
to be this that we kind of forget, um, you know, how it can really be used to inform decisions. The last is comparisons. And so that goes back to what we were just looking at is really identifying across classrooms or, um, you know, in comparison to a benchmark or um, a target of, you know, where are the more effective interactions, where are the less effective interactions, so that we can start to figure out where to support um, teachers. Okay. So here's an example of what you might, um, that a graph that shows trends. Um, so in this example, we see um, the on your, this is called the Y axis, you remember from, long ago in elementary school <laughs> um, that on the y-axis we have the number of classrooms and so all together this graph shows about 10 classrooms at a program and it's showing the variability of instructional support scores across um, the classrooms in that program so you see one classroom scored between a one and a two four classrooms scored between a two and a three three classrooms scored between a three and a four, and four classroom, or I'm sorry, two classrooms scored between a four and a five. So this helps you know, okay, most, when I just look at the majority of my classrooms, they're sort of in this two to three, um, and even in the three to four range. So they're right here at, at about a three. So that helps me say, okay, I know where most of my classrooms are, and so then I can start to make decisions on, um, I, I want to bring them up. And so I do want to focus then on instructional support. So that helps you just get an idea of where is where the majority of the people um, that you're supporting. Okay, next one, please. So I know this one's confusing. There's a lot of lines, um, but it's helpful in showing then just the growth across time. So we can see, um, you know, you measured it in the fall and then you did some coaching and then you measured again in the spring. Um, and so each line, there's a little key over here, but each line is an individual classroom, individual teacher. And so you can actually see that for the most part, the teachers have gone up. They've gone up different amounts. So one teacher went from a one to almost a four. So, you know, really it's, it would, that's also helpful just to, to build up that teacher, but then to say, okay, what's happening with that teacher? Why is that teacher having such amazing growth? What happened and how could we recreate that um, in other classrooms? And really, again, you see, you can see something like, okay, I know that everybody's growing, um, uh, except maybe this teacher C7. Okay, I need to look into that a little bit more. I need to understand, um, you know, it wasn't a big dip, but there's a little bit of di a dip. What happened? Um, you know, was there a change in the classroom? Was there a change for the teacher, change with the children? Um, you know, whatever those things are that happen, um, let me understand that a little bit more, and then I can help um, figure out where to support that teacher. Okay. Um, and so finally, um, the comparison. So we saw another table with comparisons where it had all of the scores. Um, and this one is just focusing on instructional support domain scores. But again, what's nice here is that you have that average line and the goal line. Um, and again, this is, so this is six classrooms and we're seeing how the, the six classrooms scored in comparison to one another and then in comparison to that average and the goal. Um, and so then this display helps a coach or an administrator, um, you know, really see again, okay, one in classroom one and two, there's something happening there that's more effective. Um, and so what's the difference? What, and again, not to, um, to call any teacher out, <laughs> um, but to be able to say, okay, let me understand what's happening in this classroom and how we can get that happening in the classrooms across the, the whole program. Okay, um, so there's just a few other considerations and I know we're getting into question time. So I will try to go through these pretty quickly. Um, so a couple of other things you just wanna think about. So you've created the report, you've created these visualizations, you know what you want to say and share out with the report. And now you just kind of think of a few of the logistics. So one of those is the timing of the report. Um, and you wanna think about how soon after the observation. Um, 
We do recognize that it takes time to do the observation, review the data, generate reports, um, but generally the sooner you can get the reports into the hands of the people who need that information, whether it's the teachers, coaches, administrators, um, really the sooner the better, right? Um, teachers are often anxious about to hear about how their classroom did. Um, you know, teachers may also recall um, you know, if you if it's just a few weeks after their observation, they may recall, oh yeah, I remember saying that or I remember doing that. And that helps to both increase buy-in um, and helps just that feedback to be more meaningful for them versus something that happened, you know, four months earlier that's going to be really hard and their classroom may look very different um, in four months. Um, I think it also helps, you know, coaches and administrators if you have that uh, feedback earlier, it helps you make a more specific plan um, for the year and not have to wait too long. But one note here is that um, often for high stakes evaluations, those results, um, typically you have to wait until all the classrooms for whatever that um, sample of classrooms is um, until they have all been observed. So that's where there might be a little bit more delay if it's really like a district wide um, or um, a statewide kind of thing that you may not you may not hear right away. The method of sharing report. So, you know, do you give a digital copy? Do you give a hard copy? You know, some of that's going to uh, depend even on um, uh, things like confidentiality and can you mail it or can you send it um, via email or send it via a secure um, cloud service, those sorts of things. The answer also depends then on the audience. So administrators or stakeholders are typically going to receive an electronic copy. Um, but especially when you're thinking about using this for, for professional development and with teachers, you know, as Sarah mentioned earlier, not just don't just um, say, okay, here's your report and then and leave it at that. But it's really um, as much as possible, share it in person. Um, and to be able to give them that specific context. If it's not possible to share them in person, we really recommend adding a personal note of, of so glad to, to come and observe your classroom. Thank you for letting me, um, you know, and here, uh, read the report. We'll follow up next week if you have any questions, things like that. Um, and sometimes it is that like the person who's delivering the report, right, that it may be a, a third party observer um, did the observation and then they're giving the report to the administrator or the coach. And so you just have to usually then the coach would um, provide that report to the teacher. Um, and then the last thing, so just a few of, you know, support. Oh, Sorry. Um, when you have questions around reading the port, like what what do you need? Um, so again, as Sarah noted, it's easier to read the report when you have that context. Um, and so we recommend having that background information on the class, um, on the data collection, all of those sorts of pieces in there so that um, they understand what this is and where it's coming from. Um, when it's professional development, again, teachers are going to benefit more likely benefit when they're re receiving this information in person with somebody who's knowledgeable about the class. Um, and then just to know again that with stakeholders, sometimes there's additional analyses to do. They want additional information or some clarification. And so there may be some back and forth um, in really helping them understand the report, especially if it's maybe at that policymaker level where um, they don't may, they maybe don't have as much of that education background or understand the tool as well. Okay, so we are ready for questions. We have about 10 minutes. Okay, and this is Sarah. I did want to also um, let you know that we have guidance documents that we've been working on for all three of the webinars, and I believe the first two will be going out today today or tomorrow. They do say draft on them. However, the content isn't really going to change. It's more uh, they may change in terms of how we present this information to people, but all the content is is solid for that. Um, and then for guidance doc, the third one on this one, we are working on it and we'll have it out to all participants as soon as possible. Thank you, Sarah. You're welcome. Great, yeah, so we have time for a few questions. And like I said, if we don't get to yours today, Sarah or Vicki will email you um, the answer to your question. I'll try to pass them along. 
So this one's from Chelsea and her question is, where can we find comparison benchmarks? Um, oh, Sarah, go ahead. I was just gonna ask Chelsea um, to type in what kind of program um, she's with. Oh yes, that would, yeah. So I think it, it will depend on, um, so like the Head Start has its own benchmarks. Um, if you're involved in a QRIS um, system often they have their own benchmarks. So it depends a little bit on the program. So Caitlin did. Okay, um, sorry for that delay. Uh, Caitlin was reading um, uh, Chelsea's uh, response uh, to me. So um, as Vicki said, we have that Head Start data um, that one can get through the eClick site. Um, and then beyond that, we don't have true updated national norms. Um, we have, um, we just don't have true updated national norms because um, the old national norms that you may see in the in the back of your class manual, or if you were trained a really long time, you saw in your in the class training, um, came from um, two longitudinal studies that at this point have been conducted quite some time ago. Um, and if you're looking at those for comparison, um, I, I actually did a quick comparison the other day um, with data from 100 um, from 1,400 classrooms in, in rural and urban settings and found that the data has all gone up from that point in time. Um, that said, uh, you really have to look at or, or figure out how your program, the demographics of your program compare to Head Start or what other ever, whatever other data set you can access because if they're not comparable populations, then it's really not a good comparison. Uh, the other thing I would say is this could also be a really good case of comparing how your program is doing year over year, so you're comparing yourself to yourself. All right, so we have a couple of questions about asking about either like what software programs do you use to report data or like do the visualizations? That's a Vicki Kintner Duffy question. And I'm going to say that's a, um, our design team question. Um, I mean, I really do mostly either use um, Excel um, or PowerPoint, um, but I also will um, personally use, I use SPSS to do statistics and they have a, um, a chart builder within there. Um, so if you have anybody that has um, access to those kinds of programs, um, there are all sorts, you can Google data visualization and there's lots of different um, programs that can, can help you both decide what is the best chart. You know, you just put in your information and kind of um, you can play around with different charts. So there's one, if you go to d3.org, um, there are, you know, some of, I will say some of the visualizations here have been created um, by our designers. Um, and I don't actually know what they use. <laughs> but you should be able, I guess to say, like you can make all of the charts that we showed can be made in Word or um, Excel or, or PowerPoint. I hope that helps. All right, so let me get back to find this question. So someone asked, what do you suggest if the report doesn't have notes on the observation, just the scores? Um, Sarah, please jump in. I mean, I think so, you know, at some point, if you don't have notes or written feedback, there's, uh, you know, I think that's why we, we recommend it if you can do it, but we recognize that it takes more time for you observe. It may, takes more time for everybody. Um, and so, you know, I think it's just as much as you can. I think then that's when I would really go to the manual and say, okay, I, I see a score of a four. Um, so I'm gonna really read through the manual and think of what that score means. Um, and, and then start to talk to the teacher about, um, you know, how do you think that this reflects your classroom? And, um, you know, what are some of the examples that really resonate with you? And then this and a score four tells me you're doing a lot of the things, um, but we need to really think about consistency. Um, and so sort of talking through it that way. But Sarah, any additions? 
Uh, no, I mean, you, you, you nailed it. Thank you. All right, so what do this as our last one? And then we can just share any of our contact information that we have. And then, like I said, if we don't get to your question today, we will email you afterwards. Um, so this is from Heather. She says, currently we don't have a report on strengths and growth for individual teachers. How do you suggest we begin this process? Right. Yeah, oh gosh. So um, I think it depends obviously who you are and if you're in the position to make that decision, then uh, and one of the things that our observers do is the same day that they did the observation, they come back and they, um, they go through their notes and they write they write an email or a, or a word doc that spells out for each dimension the strengths and um, and the areas for growth while it's still fresh in their mind because as we all know um, the notes that people take during a class observation are also are often illegible but I think if you get if the observers get into the habit of doing that or you introduce that, that this is what we're going to do then you're going to have the basis for um, for sharing that kind of information. And obviously you can use, um, you know, a, 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 a Google Doc template for people to put their information into and then, um, you know, generate reports, or, you know, use it to begin to generate reports. Um, and I'd also probably be remiss if I didn't say that our My Teach Stone um, platform um, has that uh, capability within it. That's what I was going to say. I think, you know, a lot of it is, um, well, two things. One, of finding the right kind of platform. So again, you know, our, our platform does it, but you could do it in Excel. You could use a Google form, you know, to have, however you're actually having them enter the data, to just have them both enter the data and then um, write up whatever their notes are, their examples, um, their strengths and their areas for growth. Um, and so that makes it easier on the observer because it's fresh. It's, you know, I've, I'm, I come back from the observation and I write it out. Um, and so, you know, it's more likely to be um, for them to remember what was in their notes basically. Um, and then the other thing is, you know, what we have also found is just really helping um, providing a training for the observers on how to write that. Um, so um, again, just to, to start to say, okay, well, let's not use language about a peer or theme, but to really write very specific as, as Sarah went through the less effective and the more effective kind of feedback of really helping them understand um, what that is. And in the guidance document for this webinar, we actually will have several examples of that, of how to write more effectively. That's exactly, what, exactly I was, what I was getting ready to point out was that we'll have that in the guidance document. All right. Well, thank you so much for joining us today, everyone. Like I said, if we didn't get to your question, I'll pass it along to Sarah and Vicki, and then they'll email you later on with the answer. Sarah, if you can go to the next slide so they can see um, just like our phone number in our website. So if you have any questions about class data, either getting started or improving what you have already, please feel free to give us a call um, at that number or emails at learnmarktwostone.com. We're always happy to help um, help you with the data you're using or help you like improve your data collection system. Um, and as I said before, this was recorded, so we'll send out the recording tomorrow. You can pass it on to friends, rewatch it, and we'll also have the PowerPoint slides in that email. Um, so thank you so much, Sarah and Vicki, for, uh, for joining us today. And um, as we said, this is part three of three, so if you didn't see the other two, go back and watch those. I'll include them in the email tomorrow so you can watch those if you didn't get to. And Thank thanks, you. Caitlin, for helping us out. And thanks, everybody, for participating. Have a great day. Have a great day, guys. Thank you. Bye.